This research jet could soon bring back supersonic commercial flights, but the pilot has to fly from a cockpit with no forward window, relying entirely on cameras and algorithms to see anything. NASA and Lockheed Martin are betting it can rewrite US flight rules, otherwise the entire program will be shut down. In 1973, the United States did something that quietly killed supersonic passenger travel over land. After years of complaints about cracked plaster, rattled windows, and angry communities under test routes, the FAA banned civilian supersonic flight over the continental US. The rule did not care how efficient your engine was or how advanced your avionics were. If you went supersonic, you made a sonic boom. And if you made a sonic boom, you were banned. For half a century, that rule turned every passenger aircraft into a subsonic design problem. Airlines optimized around 850 to 900 kilometers per hour cruise. Airframe companies occasionally studied business jets capable of Mach 2, but none could promise overland sonic booms quiet enough to be certified by regulators. On paper, faster travel was possible, but in practice, there was no evidence that communities would accept any kind of shockwave overhead. However, that missing data set is what the X-59 QSST is built to produce. The barrier was not speed, it was acoustics in the lower atmosphere. When an aircraft flies faster than sound, roughly 340 meters per second at sea level and about 295 meters per second at 16 kilometers altitude, pressure disturbances cannot propagate forward and instead stack into a Mach cone. For conventional slender supersonic aircraft, this cone reaches the ground as a sharp N wave, a rapid pressure rise, a brief plateau, then a rapid drop, lasting only a few tenths of a second. The peak overpressure for something Concorde-sized was often above 80 to 90 pascals, which people perceived as a sudden bang rather than a benign transient. That impulse was strong enough to crack a small percentage of brittle window panes, leaving regulators with a measurable damage metric on top of annoyance statistics. Reducing that peak without simply flying higher or slower requires reshaping the entire pressure field around the aircraft. The target NASA set was a ground signature around 75 decibels, which is a level similar to a car door closing a few meters away. The signature also had to be stretched in time from a sharp N wave into a more rounded, multi-peak shaped boom so that its energy was distributed over several hundred milliseconds. Doing that in the real atmosphere with temperature gradients and crosswinds is where the X-59's geometry comes in, and engineers had already done smaller scale experiments in the past. In the early 2000s, a modified F-5 with a reshaped nose produced a ground signature roughly 3 to 6 decibels lower than the baseline configuration at similar Mach and altitude. Later, a series of F-15 tests showed that you could trade some lift and drag for a few more decibels of reduction. But these were incremental changes on existing fighters with fixed engine placement, fixed cockpits, and fixed wing planforms. To reach a repeatable 75 decibels target from a clean sheet, NASA's analysis suggested you needed a fully sculpted 25 to 30 meters fuselage, a specific volume distribution and strict control of the engine's contribution to the shock pattern. And the X-59 is the hardware embodiment of those calculations. Its fuselage is about 29 meters long, but the cabin occupies only a short segment near the nose. The rest is volume sculpted to control pressure rise along the Mach cone. The nose alone is on the order of 11 to 12 meters, designed so that the initial compression starts very gently and builds over several meters instead of spiking in the first 1 to 2 meters. However, that nose immediately created a secondary problem. With such an extreme length and slenderness ratio, there was no practical way to give the pilot a forward optical view that satisfied standard certification criteria for runway visibility. The engineering requirement became clear. Accept a zero visibility cockpit in the forward direction and replace the entire view with an external vision system. This meant designing a camera and display suite with enough resolution, dynamic range, and latency performance to guide the aircraft through takeoff and landing while regulators compared it against traditional glass. While avionics teams worked on that, aerodynamicists focused on the engine. Instead of hanging a turbojet under the wing or burying it in the tail, the X-59 uses a single GEF-414 class engine mounted high on the fuselage 
with an inlet on top. The goal is to shield the engine's inlet and exhaust shocks from directly reaching the ground, where they would add high-frequency components and raise the perceived loudness by several decibels. Mounting the engine on the back also allows the lower fuselage to remain clean, preserving the carefully shaped underside that controls the expansion part of the shock signature. However, a dorsal intake at Mach 1.4 presents a boundary layer problem. At 16 kilometers, the local Mach number over the top of the fuselage is higher than the free stream, and the local pressure and temperature distributions can easily cause distortion at the fan face if the inlet is not properly designed. To handle that, the team designed an S-shaped duct with a fixed diverter and a contoured bump to push the boundary layer aside before it reaches the inlet lip. The curvature of the duct and the size of the bump were tuned in wind tunnels so that total pressure distortion at the engine face stayed below allowable limits. These margins were essential because any inlet unstart at Mach 1.4 would not only threaten the engine, but also collapse the carefully designed shock pattern, producing an uncontrolled sonic boom. Underneath, the wing had to meet contradictory requirements. Cruise conditions called for a relatively low wing loading at Mach 1.4, giving a design lift coefficient in the range of 0.1 to 0.2 to maintain efficiency. Takeoff and landing at conventional runways demanded acceptable stall speeds, typically below 135 to 140 knots, with controllable behavior and enough margin over approach speeds set in the 120 to 130 knot range but slender, highly swept wings optimized for supersonic flights tend to stall abruptly. To solve that problem, engineers selected a moderate sweep and a super critical style airfoil specialized for low boom shaping, then added high lift systems such as trailing edge flaps and carefully sized leading edge devices. The flap deflection angles, hinge locations, and actuation sequences were tuned so that at sea level density and approach speed, the wing could generate lift coefficients above 1.5 without creating vortices that would distort the nose shock pattern. The structural team also faced hard engineering challenges. The aircraft's maximum takeoff mass had to stay within limits compatible with a single F414 class engine, which delivers on the order of 60 to 70 kN of dry thrust and about 90 to 100 kN with afterburner. That set an upper bound on gross mass in the 14 to 15 ton range if reasonable takeoff field lengths around 2,000 meters were to be maintained. With that constraint, every kilogram allocated to low boom shaping, such as extra fuselage length or fairings, had to be matched by savings in secondary structure, systems, or payload. When the first miniature wind tunnel models went into test, the results were not immediately within targets. Early configurations produced ground signatures that were smoother than classic N waves, but still peaked near 80 decibels under standard atmospheric conditions, roughly 5 decibels louder than the program goal. Analysis of pressure traces from arrays spaced tens of meters apart showed that a mid-fuselage volume change and the engine installation were contributing to unwanted secondary shocks. On the next iteration, designers reshaped a fairing near the wing root trailing edge and adjusted the tail. Another round of tests saw the modeled signature drop by several decibels, but only when the aircraft flew within a narrow band of Mach and altitude. This was the mid-program reversal. The low boom shape was more sensitive to operating conditions than expected. Small deviations of plus or minus 0.02 in Mach or a few hundred meters in altitude could push the ground signature outside the desired corridor by three to four decibels. That level of sensitivity would be difficult to control in day-to-day -day operations, especially when flying over communities with variable weather. In response, the team expanded the analysis to include realistic atmospheric profiles with temperature gradients and crosswinds, and then adjusted the size of the nose and canard wings to broaden the sweet spot in flight conditions. Control laws for the digital fly-by-wire system were also updated so that, in demonstration mode, the autopilot would hold speed and altitude to tight tolerances while minimizing control surface deflections that could disturb the pressure field. The cockpit vision system went through a similar cycle of trial and refinement. Initial concepts used a pair of high-resolution cameras mounted near the nose with a field of view equivalent to a conventional cockpit, feeding a large display in front of the pilot. 
However, flight simulation tests showed that, during flare and rotation, pilots needed additional cues about runway edges and horizon alignment, especially in low visibility conditions. To solve this, engineers added synthetic vision elements based on terrain databases, overlaying a wireframe runway model on the live image with less than 100 milliseconds latency. Brightness, contrast, and symbology size were also tuned so that pilots could better judge sync rate. Those parameters were validated in simulator runs with measured touchdown dispersion, aligning the performance with existing standards for approach guidance. While the aircraft was still in assembly, the acoustic side of the mission was being built on the ground. NASA defined community test ranges where microphone arrays and human survey centers would be set up beneath the X-59's flight paths. Each array consists of multiple sensors spaced tens of meters apart, sampling pressure at kilohertz rates to capture the fine structure of the arriving shock wave. From each pass, engineers expect to extract peak overpressure, rise time, duration, and frequency content, along with the noise metric. In parallel, residents in each area will be asked to rate the annoyance of the sound on standardized scales, producing thousands of data points that correlate noise metrics with human response. The program plan includes on the order of hundreds of flights spread over multiple communities, enough to cover a range of atmospheric conditions and urban layouts. Before any of those overflights, the X-59 has to prove itself in more conventional test campaigns. Initial flights will take place in restricted airspace, starting with subsonic sorties at altitudes around 3 to 5 kilometers to verify handling qualities, systems performance, and external vision behavior. As confidence builds, the envelope opens toward transonic and supersonic regimes, stepping Mach number in increments of 0.1 and altitude in steps of roughly 1 to 2 kilometers. Onboard instrumentation will measure structural strains, inlet pressures, control surface loads, and temperatures across the airframe, with particular attention to nose heating at Mach 1.4, where fuselage temperatures can rise considerably. Microphone arrays under these initial supersonic tracks will provide the first real-world comparison between predicted and actual low sonic boom signatures. If these early flights confirm the acoustic models within a margin of a few decibels, the aircraft moves into its primary role, community response testing. Here, the operational pattern changes. Instead of looping above a restricted range, the X-59 will cruise along straight tracks over selected towns at fixed speeds, altitude, and heading. The payoff, if the numbers line up, is a new regulatory standard expressed not as a simple ban, but as a limit on ground signature. Instead of no supersonic flight over land, rules might state that commercial supersonic aircraft must keep community overflight signatures below a specific decibel threshold. However, the trade-offs will remain. Low boom shaping tends to increase wetted area and structural length, adding drag and mass. Mounting engines on the back with top-mounted inlets reduces sonic boom, but can raise inlet losses and complicate maintenance. These penalties will show up in fuel burn, seat count, and ticket price estimates. But without a measured, regulator-accepted low sonic boom standard, none of those trade-offs could even be evaluated against real rules. What began as a set of equations about pressure waves is becoming a full-scale reference aircraft. If the X-59 proves that it works, it will give regulators a concrete basis for rewriting rules that have been static since 1973 and decide whether quiet supersonic flight is finally acceptable over land. But this careful approach to speed is very different from how engineers tried to break limits in the past. Decades earlier, there was a bomber so fast that its paint literally started peeling off the fuselage in flight. And yet, it vanished after only a few tests. Click the video on your screen to see what happened to that aircraft and why a bomber built to outrun missiles never made it into service.